We pray to prepare to open God's Word this morning. Let's pause and ask for the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Father, this morning we ask that you would come by your Holy Spirit to give us wisdom, to open the Scriptures to us, to give us understanding, not just for our minds intellectually, but for our hearts, for our lives. Father, we have gathered this morning to be changed by the power of your word and the work of your Holy Spirit. We ask then that this book would be made living to us and active in us and through us, Father. Show us yourself. Show us our Savior. Show us ourselves in truth. Make this book live to us. We pray it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to begin this morning in Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. I'm going to start reading in verse 13. This is on Resurrection Day. The women have already been to the tomb. And we meet two other characters later that day. Luke 24, starting in verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, And now our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some of our women, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb earlier this morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Often we hear phrases like, oh, to be a fly on the wall, right? To have heard this thing or that thing that we think would have been momentous. I think about books, probably because my mom was an English teacher. I don't know. It's just her fault, I guess. You know, but I have to say I didn't really care to read, but now I've learned to love to read and now I don't have time. So something must have stuck, mom. (laughs) I wonder what's the greatest book you've never read? The greatest movie you've never watched or the most amazing song you've never sung. Maybe the most life-changing sermon you've never heard. Most avid readers have their favorite books and some that they've read, uh, some that are on their bucket list that they've always wanted to read but never. Same is true for film enthusiasts and music lovers. Some of us have a similar affinity towards listening to sermons or reading sermons. I know that's odd for a preacher to enjoy sermons, but... I'm sure it's much to my mother's chagrin that I've never been an avid reader of classics. I appreciate the work of Steinbeck, was sort of fascinated by Poe, despised Stephen Crane and the Red Badge of Courage and all that. I was completely bored with Hemingway. I was terrified to even approach Melville. I mean, have you seen Moby Dick? The book is huge. And I'm sure there's uh, ample disagreement among those bibliophiles, those book lovers, about what's the greatest of all the classic works. And I would venture to guess, though, that the vast majority of sermon aficionados 
they probably all have the same sermon at the top of their wish I'd heard that list. And it was probably Christ's exposition of the entire Old Testament to these two men. The greatest sermon that's probably never recorded. We know that he explained the entire Old Testament uh, and how it directly points to him, but Luke doesn't record for us what Jesus said or how he explained it. It is, if you like, the greatest sermon that no one has, in our day has heard. Yet we have an advantage over those two men that they didn't have. This entire canon of God's special revelation, we have both the Old and the New complete testaments. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit as our guide into all the truth, things that these two gentlemen didn't have. Our recently completed series, or nearly completed series, on the big picture of the Bible from this biblical theological perspective as opposed to a systematic uh, perspective which takes a topic and looks at all the teaching of Scripture and condenses it. Biblical theology takes a, takes a topic or a theme and runs it through the Bible from beginning to end. And we've used the kingdom of God as our lens, God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. It was just an attempt to scratch the surface of learning to know Christ and teach Christ and love Christ through all the scriptures. My prayer is that we're better able now to see all the promises of God fulfilled in Christ. Indeed, all our hope, all of our life is Christ than when we first began. And that now we could begin to point others to Christ from any part of scripture, just as the risen Christ did on that day, point those two men from Moses and the prophets and all the scriptures. And I wonder where he began. Where did he begin when he was in Moses? Maybe he began with Adam, our first parent, this man. Luke calls him a son of God, not in the only begotten sense, but in the, in the, uh, the genealogy of Christ. Luke ties it all the way back to Adam, the son of God, the original image bearer, one blessed with provision and purpose and, and given a promise. And Adam failed to fulfill his charge because of sin. And that brought death and suffering and separation on the entire created order, which is now under a curse. And sin then would reign in death, as Paul said in Romans 5, sin would reign in death from Adam onward through all who were in Adam, which is all of us. Yet, God showed mercy. God had grace. He covered Adam and Eve's sin by way of the death of something innocent to give them clothes. He granted them an extended life rather than instantaneous physical death, though they were separated from his presence and separated from the tree of life. They were given a promise of a seed who would come and fulfill the mandate to have dominion and to subdue the entire earth and crush the serpent's head. So Eve had Cain, and she thought, oh, the Lord has given me a man, surely thinking this would be the serpent crusher, but then instead Cain crushes his brother. And sin again produces death. But God was again gracious and provided the beginning of a new godly line, a godly seed in Seth. And so there was death because of sin, but God had a way of bringing life through that. Fast forward to Noah. The entire earth is consumed with wickedness and wicked people and the ravaging effects of sin and death. And this invites the judgment of God on the entire earth. Yet God showed grace and he had mercy to Noah and his family, eight of them in all, preserving his people and the ark. And the waters that came brought both judgment and salvation at the same time. First Peter and Hebrews 11 both talk to Noah's faith in God's promise, in leaving that world behind, in trusting God, and what that looks like from a New Testament perspective, if you ever want to go read that. The earth was full of sin and full of death, but God had a way of bringing forth life, of preserving life from death by his powerful, sovereign hand, securing life for his people. Until life, again, was spoiled by sin and death. You don't have to... You don't have to read much further before we're right back to the same old story. Sin and death. We'll fast forward then to Abraham. Maybe he surely spoke of Abraham, this pagan man wandering around out there with his family, called sovereignly by God's choice to become 
the one through whose family he would bring blessing to the entire earth, to all the families of the earth. And God separated this man out and promised to build his everlasting kingdom through Abraham's line and through Abraham's family. But like Paul records in Romans 4, the author of Hebrews says the same thing in Hebrews 11, that Abraham, because of his age, was as good as dead. As good as dead. Paul says he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old. Or Sarah's barren womb. Despite Abraham and his sinful failures, of which there were many, God still preserved his promised seed through that man. There was ample sin, all kinds of death, yet God was gracious and God preserved and brought forth life from death. We think about Isaac. We don't have to go very far. We remember Isaac. We remember Isaac, this promised son. We remember him bound. We remember him laid on an altar. We remember Abraham's hand with a knife over his son, Isaac, as good as dead. Yet, God preserved him. And in a sense, Isaac was brought back from the dead. The author of Hebrews writes in chapter 11, he considered, this is Abraham, he considered that God was even able to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. In a sense, Isaac was dead, and he was brought back to life. God again, being gracious, looking at death, looking at sin, and producing life because that's what God does. Then you get to Isaac's grandson, Joseph, young man blessed by God with wisdom and purpose and, and great promise, although he was kind of a brat, to be honest. And his brothers didn't take very kindly to God's sovereign plan for their little brother. And the little brother didn't do a very good job of not rubbing it in their face, I don't think. And so what happened? Because of that sin then, he found himself left for dead, sold into slavery. But God's own sovereign design was for this very exile, this very journey of faith, this exodus, if you will, was meant on purpose to preserve life for his people. A father's experience of the death of his boy, because for all intents and purposes, Jacob knew that Joseph was dead. His sons told him Joseph was dead. They brought the coat back with blood on it and said, he's dead. From that experience of death, the death of his boy, and facing the death of his family in the famine that would come not too many years later, from that death to life, not only for the boy when they find out he's alive, but for the whole future family when they're brought to Egypt, made possible to that son that was sent ahead into the world to make a way for his brothers and sisters to be saved. A son, rejected by his family, sent ahead to preserve life for his brothers and sisters. Well, then what happens? Sin persists. God finds people, God's people find themselves in slavery. They find themselves suffering. As a nation, they are as good as dead. Sin reigned through death, even to the point of baby boys being sentenced to death from the moment they're born. Yet God preserved his people, preserved life from death. And we have baby Moses in the bulrushes, a boy who was as good as dead by Pharaoh's command, yet God was able to protect and preserve and carve out a, a life for him. And this man was raised up to lead the people of God from slavery and suffering to freedom and worship, to be made into a nation, a corporate people of God, a people as good as dead brought into a new life. Even within that whole overarching event, God demonstrates this pattern of powerful and miraculous salvation, bringing both judgment and salvation in single acts. We think about the Passover. A substitute lamb is killed, one per household, and that judgment of death then would pass over those who were covered by that blood in that house. Judgment at the same time brought to the wicked, to the Egyptians, to those who were uncovered, judgment, to those who were covered, life and salvation. 
We're thinking about the Red Sea. God's people passed through those waters on dry ground and were saved. And those same waters then condemned and judged the wicked. In one act, God gives judgment to the wicked, salvation to his people from death to life. And God raised up one man to bring God's powerful and miraculous salvation to his people. And as a result, a people that was as good as dead in slavery to the wicked world were freed to be brought to meet God, to receive the revelation of his law, which is a reflection of his character and his righteousness, and to receive a call to live holy lives that reflect the glory and the character of a God who'd saved them. Then they become a nation, and we have David and the monarchy, and time and time again, God's people faced almost certain death, constantly also plagued by sin and its effects, both from within the, their camp and from without, from their enemies, from within and without. Defeat, death, strife, suffering, separation. These all remained a part of the experience of the nation of Israel because of the influence of sin. Yet God continued to act in miraculous power to preserve a godly remnant by sovereign grace. The judgment of exile was a stark reminder of the consequences of sin to the people of God. Still, he preserved a remnant. He brought them back by grace. During that period, the people of God received Prophetic promises of a Savior, of a Messiah, of one who would come to deliver the people of God back into the place of God, to live under the rule of God and to enjoy his blessing forever. Indeed, the whole earth and the way they spoke, the whole earth would be transformed and brought under subjection in the kingdom of God. A world brought from death to life, restored to a new beginning. That was the promise. Till we get to Christ. Christ himself, who is the promised seed of the woman, the offspring of Abraham, the son of David. He is the Messiah. He accomplished all that the first Adam failed because of Adam's sin. He lived according to the law and the character of God as Israel failed to do because of its sin. He proclaimed the coming of the kingdom of God and established his everlasting rule as David was unable himself to do because of David's sin. Jesus Christ fulfilled all that God had intended for his image bearers to accomplish, but which they had all failed to do since the garden because of sin. Perfect, unspoiled relationship between a sovereign and his subject. That was always the intention. A perfect relationship between God and his creation. Total dominion over all of the created order All that man was unable to do because of sin, Christ accomplished in perfect, sinless righteousness because in every way he was the sinless, righteous God himself. Not only was Christ sinless, but to secure life and blessing of God for all the people of God, he himself became that substitute, that sacrificial lamb. As John the Baptist said, John 1, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the world's sin. Maybe we think about Paul in, in, in second, or 1 Corinthians 5, when he refers to Christ as our Passover Lamb. In this way, the people of God, those who believe and trust in the Lord alone, were covered with the blood and judgment passed over them, passed over you, passed over me, brought you from death, to life because that's what God does. They passed through the waters and were saved. Peter speaks about those waters of the judgment in Noah's day as being connected like our baptism in which we were buried and brought to new life. We came out on the other side, amen, from death to life because that's what God does. In a single act, one sacrifice for all time, for all the people of God, God wrought both judgment on sin and salvation for his people. This is a miraculous sovereign power of God to bring the dead to life. Again, God preserves his people and brings life from death, but this time the life powerfully and miraculously produced is secured for all in the household of faith by one Passover lamb, not many. 
never to be spoiled, never lost by those placed in Christ. And the ultimate ark, the son sent ahead to prepare a way for his brothers and sisters, the mighty prophet of, of whom Moses spoke, the ultimate priest who went behind the curtain for our sake and then removed the veil, broke down the barrier, the king who sets on the everlasting throne of his father David, the only begotten son, the ultimate image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, the last Adam. This is Jesus Christ, the risen one. Today, we celebrate the ultimate bringing of life from death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, an event in history with eternal ramifications, eternal consequences. And the Holy Spirit testifies through Peter to the significance of what was accomplished for us through the resurrection of Jesus. This is what Peter says in 1 Peter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ was an actual historical event that took place 2,000 years ago. But in a very real and a very spiritual sense, the people of God, those placed in Christ from before the foundation of the world, those whom the Father gave to the Son, those ones genuinely participated and identify with Christ in those events. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 6. Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death, in a death like his, we shall certainly be united, certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Did you catch the condition? If we're united with Christ in his death and burial, if you're united with Christ in his death and burial, then you are certainly united with him in his resurrection. None for whom Christ died will see hell. None, not one. If you are united with Christ in his death, then you will be united with him in his resurrection. The separate, to the, to the separate two, to separate the two, sorry, to separate death and, and, and resurrection is to profane and disregard the work of Christ. Because he died and because he lives, if we died with him, like Paul says in Galatians, for I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. The life I live in the body, Christ lives in me. Right? Paul goes on to explain that this victory that we have in Christ is one that demonstrates victory over the greatest enemy, the enemy that continually, as we saw, spoiled time and time and time again all that God had planned, what Adam failed to do. Why? Because of his sin. What Noah and Abraham, and Jacob, and Isaac, and Esau, and, well, of course Esau, David, all those, why did they fail all those times? Because of sin. But not Christ. Christ is the one who conquered sin and death for his people. Romans 6, 6, Paul goes on to say, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So in Christ, we already have died to sin, to slavery and suffering, and therefore we have defeated death. Therefore, our right response to this, the fruit of what Christ has already accomplished, is freedom to live and worship in a manner that's worthy and reflective of the glory of our righteous and holy God. Paul goes on to say, For the one who's died has been set free from sin. Now, if we die with Christ... We believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. In a very real sense, we who are in Christ have already truly 
participated and identified with Christ in his death, his burial, and if those, then also in his resurrection. If you're in Christ, you're alive in the truest sense of the word. Paul says that if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. In Ephesians, Paul writes in chapter 2, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. What do you call it when the dead comes to life? I call that a resurrection. We were dead in our trespasses. God made us alive together with Christ. That's, by the way, in the past tense. I got that right. That's the past tense. Made. Not will make if you. No check boxes. God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's a resurrection, folks. Paul also writes in Colossians 2, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So in a very real sense, in a biblical sense, in a spiritual sense, we've already experienced a form of resurrection. And we have and are seeing the increasing reality of that in our lives. Sin's defeated and we're free. Sin's already defeated, but still fighting. We've not yet reached the fullness of that victory in this life. We're not perfect yet, but we're better than we were. We're progressive. This is called sanctification. See, Jesus spoke about this too. I don't know if you you remember his words in John 5. He said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. This is John 5, 24. <clears throat> Has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. That's a resurrection. It's a resurrection, but one which comes to those who are dead apparently in a different way than a bodily fashion. Notice that the time is coming and is now here, he said. That's 2,000 years ago. And that those dead are not in tombs. Why is that important? Because if you go to 28, that's what he starts to talk about. Do not marvel at this for an hour is coming. Notice he doesn't say that this one is here yet. An hour is coming when all who are in tombs will hear his voice. Spiritually dead people aren't in tombs. Bodily dead people are in tombs. But the spiritually dead are dead nonetheless. All who are in tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who've done good to the resurrection of life and those who've done evil to the resurrection of judgment. That's a resurrection, but different than the first one. This one, that time is not yet here. These dead are in tombs. All the dead, both the righteous and the wicked, participate in that event. Therefore, it seems scripturally consistent to interpret the first as a spiritual resurrection and the second as the bodily resurrection. Makes me think of this in Revelation 20. I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand a key to the bottomless pit, a great chain, and he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended, and after that he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and seated on them were those who had the authority to judge, to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead didn't come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first 
resurrection, speaking of those who came to life and reigned with Christ. That's the first resurrection. Listen to what happens to those. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power. Over whom does hell have no power? Over the saved, over those who are spiritually alive. But they will be priests of God and of Christ. That's Old Testament language. Old Testament language also used by Peter to describe the church. They will be priests of God and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Reminds me of when Christ said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. When did he see that? When he sent the 72 out and they came back proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. When does Paul say Satan was bound? Christ said, if you're going to go into the strong man's house and plunder it, you've got to bind him first. And when did Paul say that Christ won the victory and defeated all the authorities? On the cross and that open tomb. Church, we are alive more than we've ever been. And those who have passed on ahead of us, Paul said they are already seated with him. They are reigning with him. Christ is on his throne right now, reigning from heaven. Those who we have sent on ahead are seated with him. In a spiritual sense, we are seated with him. We are alive right now and the kingdom is ours. And it cannot be taken. And it will never fall, ever, not ever. Because even when that thousand years is ended, when Satan is let loose to deceive the nations, you see, sin is defeated in you, but it still fights its dying breath. And Satan knows his time is short and he's already bound by the gospel. He can't overcome the gospel. He can't win. The gospel wins. The gospel wins everywhere and it is spread through the world and it will continue to do so. And even when he's let loose at the end, God comes and removes death the last enemy, and he conquers everything. So what's our response then as we bring this to a close? Having laid out all of this from Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, we've been through the whole book now. What's the point? What's the call? How does that impact you and I? Paul says in Colossians 3, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, Set your minds on things that are above, not things that are on the earth, for you've died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. We are inseparably connected to Christ. We are in the ark and God has shut the door. He is our life, therefore we are to walk in ways that reflect his glory full of grace and truth. Do you know him? Are you in the ark? Have you believed and trusted in him and him only? Those two men on the road to Emmaus were walking with the risen Christ and for a time they didn't know him. And how did they eventually come to recognize him? So I bring your attention back to Luke as we close. There's a rest of the story in verse 28. Luke goes on to write, so they drew near to the village to which they were going and he acted as if he were going for as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's toward evening, and the, and the day is now far spent. So he went to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened. And they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened the scriptures to us? They rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord has risen indeed. See, we don't just make this stuff up. <laughs> the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And then they told what, they had happen what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. We come now to a table to break bread together in remembrance and grateful celebration of the person and the work of Jesus Christ in whom God has fulfilled all of his great and precious promises to his people. If you know him today, we welcome you to this table. 
If you don't yet know life in the Lord Jesus, I invite you to prayerfully consider the testimony of Scripture that you've heard. It's true. It's real. It's real history. It's real wisdom. It's real truth. It's the real gospel. It's real life. Respond to that truth in faith and repentance. Submit to the Lord Jesus Christ as King and be saved. And pass over from death to life. Amen.